what CPU cache is and why it exists. When a CPU runs code, it constantly needs to fetch data and instructions, numbers, addresses, commands. But there's a problem. Main memory, or dynamic random access memory, is way too slow compared to the CPU itself. A modern processor can complete billions of operations per second, but when it asks for data from main memory, it has to wait hundreds of CPU cycles for that data to arrive. Imagine a sprinter stopping mid-race to ask for directions. That's how bad the slowdown is. To solve this, CPUs use a smaller, much faster type of memory called cache memory. It's built directly into the processor and made of static random access memory, which doesn't need to be constantly refreshed like dynamic random access memory. That means it can deliver data almost instantly, but it's also far more expensive and takes up more physical space on the chip. So the CPU can't use cache for everything. Instead, it uses it as a middleman between the slow main memory and the ultra-fast CPU cores. Frequently used data and instructions are stored in this cache so that the CPU can grab them immediately without having to wait. Think of it like a chef who keeps salt and oil within arm's reach, while the rest of the ingredients are in the pantry. The CPU cache is that quick-reach shelf. Now, modern CPUs organize their cache into levels, forming what's called a cache hierarchy. Each level strikes a different balance between speed, size, and distance from the core. The closer the cache is to the core, the smaller and faster it is. The farther it is, the larger and slower it gets. These are the levels you'll hear about. Level 1 cache, the smallest and fastest. Level 2 cache, larger but slower. And level 3 cache, the biggest but slowest of the group. Some high-end designs even add a level 4 cache, which acts like a turbocharged staging area between the CPU and main memory. Each of these levels plays a specific role in keeping the CPU fed with data, so it never stalls waiting for information. Level 1 cache, the CPU's immediate memory. Level 1 cache, often called primary cache, is the CPU's fastest and smallest memory. It's built directly inside each CPU core and operates at the same clock speed as that core. That means every time the processor performs an instruction, it can check level 1 cache in just a few CPU cycles, almost instantly. Level 1 cache typically comes in two parts. Level 1, data cache, stores actual data that the core needs to read or write. Level 1, instruction cache, stores decoded instructions that tell the core what to do next. This split design allows the CPU to fetch data and execute instructions in parallel, shaving off even more latency. In other words, while one part of the level 1 cache handles the what, the other handles the how. Because it needs to be lightning fast, level 1 cache is very small, usually between 16 kilobytes and 128 kilobytes per core, depending on the processor design. In most architectures, it uses a structure called associativity, which defines how many slots or paths it can use to find stored data. Typical associativity for level 1 cache is between 2-way and 8-way, meaning it can look up data in multiple multiple locations at once, making hits more likely and faster. The access time is measured in just a few CPU cycles, roughly between two and four cycles in modern designs. That's incredibly fast, especially when compared to main memory, which can take hundreds of cycles to respond. However, the trade-off for that speed is size. Once the level 1 cache fills up, older or less used data has to be replaced with new information. If the CPU looks for something in level 1 and doesn't find it, that's called a cache miss. In that case, the request gets passed down to the next level, level 2 cache. So, you can think of level 1 as the processor's equivalent of short-term memory. Lightning fast, but limited. It holds only what's immediately needed, and it forgets just as quickly when something new arrives. Level 2 cache, the middleman between speed and size. When the CPU can't find the data it needs in level 1 cache, it immediately checks level 2 cache. Level 2 cache acts as a backup layer, slower than level 1, but much larger. It's where the CPU stores data and instructions that might be needed soon, but aren't in active use at the exact moment. Unlike level 1, level 2 cache is usually unified, meaning it stores both data and instructions in one shared space. This simplifies design and allows the CPU to manage larger chunks of information more efficiently. Level 2 cache is still located on the CPU die, physically close to the cores, but it's not always tied directly to the clock speed of each core. It can run slightly slower, which is the trade-off for being larger and having more capacity. In most modern CPUs, level 2 cache sizes range from 256 kilobytes to about 2 megabytes megabytes per core. Older or specialized CPUs might have even larger per core caches, depending on the architecture. The latency here is typically around 4 to 10 CPU cycles, which is still very fast compared to system memory. Level 2 cache also uses higher associativity, often between 4-way and 16-way, to reduce the number of misses. A higher associativity means that each block of memory can be found in more possible places inside the cache, improving hit rates at the cost of slightly more complexity, because each CPU core usually has its 
own level 2 cache. The core can operate independently without constantly fighting other cores for data access. This makes multi-core performance far more efficient. When data is requested by the core and not found in level 1, the CPU checks level 2. If it finds the data there, it copies it back up to level 1 for faster future access, a process called cache promotion. But if level 2 also misses, the request falls further down to level 3 cache, the largest and slowest on the chip. So level 2 cache is the balancing act in the hierarchy, the perfect midpoint between raw speed and available space, fast enough to keep the CPU running smoothly, but big enough to store more of what it might need next. Level 3 cache, the shared backup for every core. When neither level 1 nor level 2 caches contain the data the CPU needs, the next stop is level 3 cache. This is where processors keep a much larger pool of data and instructions that can be accessed by all cores. Unlike the first two levels, which are private to each core, level 3 cache is usually shared across the entire CPU. That means if one core fetches data that another core later needs, the second one can grab it directly from level 3 instead of going all the way to main memory. This drastically improves efficiency in multi-core systems and reduces redundant memory fetches. Level 3 cache is built to be big and inclusive. Typical sizes range from 2 megabytes to 32 megabytes, depending on the processor. Some high-end workstation and server CPUs, like AMD's EPIC or Apple's M-series chips, can go even higher, exceeding 32 megabytes per die. But size comes with a cost, speed. Level 3 cache is slower than level 2, with a latency that typically sits between 10 and 40 CPU cycles, depending on architecture and load. However, that's still dramatically faster faster than fetching data from system RAM, which can take hundreds of cycles. Level 3 cache also tends to have a high associativity, often 16-way or higher, allowing it to store and find data blocks with much more flexibility. This helps keep cache hit rates high, even with massive amounts of data being shuffled around between cores. Architecturally, Level 3 cache often sits as a large ring that connects all CPU cores. Each core can access it through high-speed internal buses, which allows data sharing without major slowdowns. This design is crucial for workloads where multiple cores are working on similar datasets, like rendering, compiling, or simulations, because it reduces the time spent waiting on memory transfers. In short, Level 3 cache acts as a shared safety net for the entire CPU. If a core misses both Level 1 and Level 2, Level 3 often saves the day before the request has to go all the way out to main memory. And in multi-core environments, it doubles as a communication bridge, keeping the team of cores in sync and reducing wasted effort. Level 4. Cache. The rare but powerful extension. Most consumer CPUs stop at level 3 cache, but in some high-end or specialized systems, you'll find one more layer, level 4 cache. This level exists mainly in server processors, workstation chips, and certain advanced laptop CPUs that need to squeeze out every last bit of efficiency. Level 4 cache serves as an off-die buffer, sitting physically outside the CPU core complex, but still much closer than main memory. It acts like a giant staging area between the CPU and the system RAM, storing recently used data and anticipating future requests from any core. You can think of it as an overflow zone. When level 3 cache runs out of room, level 4 catches whatever spills over, so the CPU doesn't have to reach into the slower main memory quite as often. Some processors implement level 4 cache using embedded DRAM, embedded dynamic random access memory, which offers a sweet spot between size and speed. This kind of cache is slower than the on-chip static memory used for levels 1 through 3, but it's still dramatically faster than system RAM. Intel's older Broadwell desktop CPUs are a well-known example. They used a 128 megabyte level 4 cache called EdRAM, which acted as a last level cache for both the CPU and the integrated GPU. This setup reduced latency for graphics workloads and improved performance in memory-intensive applications without requiring more physical RAM bandwidth. In servers, the concept can go even further. Some modern server chips and high-performance compute architectures integrate massive off-die caches, sometimes measured in hundreds of megabytes, to to handle parallel data streams more efficiently across many cores. Level 4 cache isn't always present because it's expensive to manufacture and adds complexity to the chip design. But when it is used, it provides a significant performance advantage in tasks like scientific computation, 3D rendering, or data analytics, anywhere that memory access speed can make or break throughput. So if level 3 cache is a shared safety net, level 4 is the emergency parachute, large, rare, but life-saving, when performance demands push memory limits to the edge. Cache hierarchy, and how data moves through it. Now that we've covered each cache level individually, it's time to explain how they actually work together. The hierarchy in action. When the CPU needs data, 
it always checks the closest cache first. That means the search begins at level 1. If the data is there, that's called a cache hit, and it's sent directly to the CPU core with almost zero delay. If it's not found, that's a cache miss, and the request moves down to level 2. If level 2 also misses, the CPU checks level 3. And only when all caches fail does it go out to main memory, which is hundreds of times slower. Here's how it works in sequence. CPU requests data. For example, a variable, an instruction, or part of a program. Check level 1 cache. If found, use it. If not, check level 2. If found there, copy it into level 1 for faster access next time. If still not found, check level 3. If found there, it's copied upward through level 2 and then level 1. If all caches miss, the CPU finally fetches the data from main memory, and it's stored in all cache levels along the way. This step-by-step -step process ensures that the next time the CPU needs the same data, it will find it instantly, ideally in level 1. This entire structure is what we call the cache hierarchy. It's designed to reduce the average time the CPU spends waiting for data. Even though the deeper levels are slower, they still act as vital shock absorbers between the ultra-fast cores and the a much slower system memory. To put it another way, level 1 is like your brain's short-term memory. Level 2 and level 3 are your notes and reminders. Main memory is the filing cabinet across the room. The hierarchy makes sure you almost never have to leave your desk to get what you need. Modern CPUs even use predictive algorithms to guess what data might be needed next. When the CPU reads a certain block of memory, it often fetches the nearby blocks too, a behavior called spatial locality. And if the CPU notices that a particular value is accessed repeatedly, it keeps that data hot in the cache using temporal locality. By combining these patterns, CPUs achieve cache hit rates that can exceed 90%. That means 9 out of 10 memory requests are handled without ever leaving the processor. This is what makes cache hierarchy one of the single biggest performance factors in modern computing. You could have hundreds of cores, but without a fast and efficient cache system, they'd spend most of their time waiting, not computing. Cache inclusion policies how levels coordinate. Not all cache hierarchies behave the same way. Different CPUs follow different inclusion policies, which determine whether data stored in one cache level is also copied to others. These policies shape how data is shared, replaced, and synchronized between levels. There are three main types, inclusive, exclusive, and non-inclusive, non-exclusive. Inclusive policy. In an inclusive cache hierarchy, any data stored in a higher level cache, like level one, is also stored in all lower levels, like level two and level three. That means means if a certain block of memory exists in level 1, it's guaranteed to exist in level 2 as well. This approach simplifies data consistency because lower caches always contain everything higher caches have, and possibly more. The downside, it's redundant. The same data occupies space in multiple caches, reducing the total unique data the system can store. Still, inclusive hierarchies are popular in designs like Intel's older Sandy Bridge, Ivy Bridge, and Skylake processors because they make cache management straightforward and predictable. Exclusive policy. An exclusive policy takes the opposite approach. If data exists in level 1, it does not exist in level 2 or level 3. Each level stores unique blocks. This prevents duplication and maximizes total capacity across all caches. The advantage is efficiency, no wasted space. The drawback is complexity. When the CPU moves data between levels, it must constantly shuffle blocks up and down to maintain exclusivity. This extra management can slightly increase latency, though the payoff is a much larger effect effective cache size. Non-inclusive, non-exclusive policy. Finally, there's the non-inclusive, non-exclusive policy, a hybrid approach used in many modern CPUs. In this system, data may or may not be duplicated across cache levels. There's no strict rule. If duplication improves performance, the CPU allows it. If it wastes space, the data is stored only once. This approach gives designers the freedom to balance latency, capacity, and efficiency for each product line. For example, AMD's Ryzen CPUs often use non-inclusive level 3 caches that dynamically adapt depending on workload behavior. Why inclusion policies matter. Inclusion policies directly affect cache coherence, which is how multiple cores keep their data consistent. In multi-core CPUs, several cores may access or modify the same memory address at once. The inclusion policy determines how those updates propagate between caches so that every core always sees the same correct data. Choosing the right inclusion policy is a delicate trade-off. Inclusive hierarchies simplify communication but waste capacity. Exclusive ones use memory efficiently but demand more complex coordination. Non-inclusive systems sit in the middle, flexible, adaptive, and well-suited for modern, mixed workloads. There's a great video on the screen now. Don't miss it, okay?